Hi everyone, I am honored to meet today with Moti Kahana. Moti, as you know, means pearl and he is for sure the pearl of this planet. Moti, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm good. So Moti, tell me who are you, how were you born, your journey. would love to learn more about your journey. How did you come to where you uh, are? I was born in Israel 48 years ago. Uh, I'm, uh, I was born in Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem. Uh, to both parents was immigrated from Romania to Israel, and both Jewish. My father passed away when I was two and a half years old, and my mom, about two years later or three years later, remarried again, and she married a Druze guy uh, from the faith of the Druze, which is close between Muslim and Judaism. Uh, then we moved to the Druze village when I was four or five years old. Uh, at the age of seven, we went back uh, as the Druze did not like my ma uh, the Druze guy to marry a Jewish woman. The Jewish side of my family did not like the Jewish woman to marry a Druze guy. And I actually grew up with a Bedouin in uh, north of Tel Aviv, actually east of Tel Aviv. And um, grew up very, very poor, really in poverty. Uh, and then later in life, I say in fourth grade, third grade, late third grade, beginning of fourth grade, I went to foster family, grew up in a foster family, and orphanage. Uh, then that's still the age of 18, served in the Israeli military, like most Israelis, uh, left the Israeli military, graduate, I mean, I was done with my military service, moved to the U.S. when I was 23 years old, and that was almost 25 years ago. And I live in the U.S. in the last 25 years. Uh, in 20 years of my life, out of those 25 years, I was in business. I was always really in business. I actually a college dropout. I went to college, and in college, notice that nobody was renting cars uh, to under 21, and I decided to be the only one to do it. Two years later, I became the biggest one in my town. A bigger company came and acquired me, and I like the idea of building businesses and selling them. And that's why I've been doing it for 20 years. I build businesses, three to five years. That's usually I like to have the time frame. I do startup. That's really my forte. I'm very uh, into the startup phase. When a bigger company acquires me, I get bought. I don't do big corporation. And I consult them usually and then start another startup. But five years ago, after 20 years of doing startup, uh, the Arab Spring started it in the Middle East, and I decided uh, to support the youth, which was calling for democracy uh, in Syria. And Syria, as being in Israel, Syria to me was my next door neighbor, and I really care for my neighbors. And I decided I'm going to go ahead and really started with humanitarian. I started humanitarian supply uh, to the people of Syria when nobody was carrying weapons in Syria. Then over the years, uh, the problem of, you know, if you think of it today, 500,000 Syrians are dead, 12 million are displaced or refugees, which is half of Syria. It was too big for me. I could no longer provide only humanitarian supply, which just was too big for me. I'm not a government. I'm not, uh, it's even big for government. And I really refocused really myself on humanitarian diplomacy, trying to connect between the Syrian people to the Israelis, between the American to some Syrian group, uh, support the Syrian opposition and the moderate Syrian opposition, and really focus on uh, helping uh, the world to understand, especially my country, Israel and the U.S., most Muslims are great people, most Syrians are great people. The fanatic, you got them all over the place, if it's in Israel, in the U.S., or in Syria, but they are a very, very small number percentage-wise. They make the most noise, but a very small number, and most people are great people, and and that's what I've been doing in the last uh, five years. So what were the startups you started? One was first was the rent-a-car. Well, first was car rental. was always in the rent-a-car space. Uh, I did rental car for a few years. Then eBay started it. eBay wanted to do eBay Motors. Was back then was eBay Miscellaneous. I was the only seller 
on eBay. More, eBay miscellaneous. If you think of it, early days was eBay miscellaneous. There was no category motors. And because I came up with this idea to sell rental car over the internet, eBay, and Yahoo was bigger back then. Yahoo Auto was bigger. eBay was miscellaneous. I noticed it was more traffic from eBay, not that much from Yahoo. And I started selling on eBay miscellaneous. I became the largest seller on eBay miscellaneous. They wanted to build eBay Motor, and I became a partner of eBay, helping them to build the eBay Motors, as you know it today. Back then was a very tiny little nothing. I did that for about two and a half years. Uh, September 11 came in, and, and September 11, the whole rental industry got beat up really, really badly. Uh, everybody was going bankrupt. Budget went bankrupt. Alamo National went bankrupt. Those all used to be my client. Uh, helping them to sell cars over the web. When everybody got beat up financially, I got beat up as well like everybody else. And by being in business, you don't win every time. You go up and down. You just stick with the mission, stick with the focus, get it done. That's what I wanted to do. And a few years after uh, everyone got beat up, I then uh, relaunched again the product. And a few years later, sold that to the Health a Global Holding Company. I worked at Health for a few years, helping them to do the same thing, selling their cars over the web. And, and in the meantime, got small other companies put together and sold that very quickly. But those was more a small company servicing the auto rental industry. Again, my forte is really rental car. That's what I do. Uh, I love problem. I love problem with uh, my own industry. And I try to figure out the solution in the industry. And that's how we sell my forte. That's why I do very well. So all the all the exits uh, you did was right. related to rental cars. I'm sorry. All the businesses you built and sold were related to automobile. I'm losing you. I think the internet is really bad. So all the businesses, so all the businesses you built you were related to rental cars. Rent. Yeah, most of my businesses in the last. Uh, 20 years was in the automotive space, uh, focus on the rental car within the automotive space. Fantastic. Um, so if you were the president of Israel, what are the three things you would do? Let me write them down for you. I lost if, if you are. Oh, <laughs> okay. If I was the president of Israel, a president doesn't have much power. The prime minister, just for the okay. record, from the age of seven years old, I would like to be in politics in Israel. I always wanted it from seven years old. But I did not want it to go to politics, like many people in the Middle East, in order to make money. That's why I came to the US. I wanted to make money and then later become and go to politics. Now, the questions probably fit what my goals in life one day to help the people of the Middle East. But if I was the Prime Minister of Israel, what are the three things mm -hmm. I will do? First thing. Uh, I think you started to do it yourself by connecting people together. People, uh, first thing I will do, I will force all the Israelis to learn Arabic. Because you cannot live in the Middle East and speak a language your next door neighbor does not speak. It has a work. That's the first thing I will do. I will put into law, if you're an Arab-Israeli citizen, you should learn English and Hebrew. And if you're a Jewish citizen of the nation of Israel, you should definitely learn English and Arabic. That's the first thing I will do. These people can communicate with each other. Fantastic. Uh, second thing, uh, what I will do, if I was the president of Israel, something I'm probably thinking about 41 years. Second, if I, second thing I will do, I'll probably try to unite the people of Israel, the Jewish people of Israel, to get them united of the views uh, the Muslims are not your enemies. Fanatic are your enemy, but not other religion is your enemy. Other religion, it's another religion. It's nothing to do with enemy or friends. Human beings are human beings. And trying to kind of conceal... You know, con consolidate, you know, and get people.
regardless of the religion, which the U.S. government does very, very well, separating state from religion. You know, you want to be religious, that's great. But state is state, religion is religion. And that's probably the second thing I would do, try to kind of separate uh, religion from state. You know, everybody welcome to pray to any God he likes, as long as you don't kill your neighbors, that's fine. And, and that's the second thing I would try to push. Uh, communication and, and, and respect other people's religion. Uh, the third thing, probably, it all goes down to money, as we know it. I'm a businessman. It's all poverty, and I think you're really into it yourself. When people have comfortable life, they're not interested of going to work. They're interested of going on vacation. They're interested of sending the kids to better education. Because that's what people will do when they live a comfortable life. That's what the goal is in life. Not to go to war. The goal will be, let's see what vacation I can take my family to. Walt Disney seems wonderful. And not Gaza at the moment. Uh, and you, you know, if probably poverty, try to uh, bring the, uh, in Israel case, 33% of people, I think 32% below poverty. The Jewish part. The Muslim probably 80%, not higher than that, uh, which is crazy. Uh, I think pushing a more middle class and try to kill poverty. Because people in poverty, when they have nothing for them to believe in, because they have no future, the poor, they go to places none of us, you and me, want them to go. And that's usually uh, being fanatic or being, you know, they're looking for the afterlife. You know, this earth is a wonderful place. Why to focus on the afterlife? Let's at least live this life the best possible as we can. And when we make it to the afterlife, let's worry about the dead. And if you do good things in this life, you probably get to a better afterlife. And, and that's, that's why the, 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 the three things I will do. Now, if you were to end play... poverty or try to end poverty, uh, connect people. And, and, and the separation of state and religion. Now, if you were the president of Palestine, what would be the three things you would do? First thing. Of Palestine? Well, I'm the exact same thing. No different. No, no, no different. There's, there's no difference between Palestinians and Israelis. There is no difference between Palestinians and Israelis. As I said, the first thing I will do if you're Palestinian, I will probably like to my people to communicate with the people living in some cases, 50 meters away from each other. Uh, in the old city of Jerusalem, you have Jews and Arab living like in the same building, and they hate each other. Communication. That's the first thing I will do. Let's learn each other's language uh, and get to know each other by communicating with each other and speaking the same language. It's really the same thing, no different. Uh, the language, the, the, the nationalism from religion, and try to kind of uh, you know, you can pray to whatever you want. We should respect each other. And, and uh, it's really the same as I will tell the Jews, I will tell the Palestinians. No different. Now, uh, a lot of people don't know that there is a lot of Muslims people living in Israel. How many percent of Israel is Muslim? I'm losing. I'm sorry, your okay. internet I will, is really... I will write down the question. How many people in Israel? 20% Muslim. There's about 20, um, right around 20, less, a little bit less than 20%, because you have Druze, Muslim, and um, Armenian, and other religion. But the non Jews are about 20%. 20%. So say 10%. So what's the population? Oh, numbers. I think Israel is about 8 million people right now. Uh, I think the Jews, Jewish people, I'm not sure if the, today is Israel birthday actually. Uh, I think, no, no, more than 700,000 Muslims. I don't know the exact number, I really don't. If I go on Wikipedia, we can put it very quickly. But uh, I think it's right over a million people. It's over a million people. Uh, non Jews, yeah. And majority, of course, are Muslim. Uh, percentage wise, are about 20%. 20% are non Jews, 80% are Jews. The minority is Israel, right around 20%. And in Israel, it is about 9 million people right now. Uh, 
uh, what's the question? How, how can Muslims can... from other countries can contact those Muslims? Are the Muslims from other countries? Well, I actually was very involved uh, last year of bringing to New York every single mayor, Arab Israeli mayor, not the Jewish mayor. I brought 40 mayors of every single Arab Israeli town to New York. And why I did it? Why a Jewish guy will finance male delegation of every single Arab Israeli town? Because to me, the Muslim citizens of Israel are exactly the same as me, the Jewish citizen of Israel. We have exactly the same right. We should have the same right. We should have exactly the same. Uh, uh, there's no difference between us. And I really, really care to bring those Arab Israeli males, all of them, to the U.S. Why? I want them to understand. I care for them to understand. And I really care and I wanted them to understand the Jews in America, we only 20%. The Jewish people we're in America. People think we more. The Jewish people controlling the world. We, we're so powerful. But you know, let me tell you the story of the Jews. And that's what I told those men. But my goal was when you go back to your town, you're only 20%, but you're almost 80% in poverty. You, you very, you know, your towns are very, very poor. Let me explain. I want him to know and to get to know the American Jewish community, what we've been through as an American Jew. My wife, she's an American Jew. And I care for them to come over here. Why? Uh, those Arab men, when they came to the U.S., I said to them, we as Jewish people, and I took him to the Jewish community in the U.S. We only 2%. We're not 20%. You in Israel, 20%. First thing you need to know, get your people to vote. Because the voting in the Arab Israeli town, the only 50%. The Jews are right around 75, 77%. And if you want to have any say in the government, go and vote. It's very, vote to whatever you want to vote. But you got to exercise your right to vote. I support the Syrian people in the last five years. What are the Syrian people asking? They're asking to vote for their own democratic government. People in Syria dying and willing to you know, that they're dying in a thousand in order to go and vote. You Arab Israeli, you have the right to vote. Go and vote. Get your people of your town to vote. That's first. Second, I want them to understand, we as Jews came to America after the Holocaust, after 1945. We had nothing left. Most of the family was killed. Most of the family was murdered in Europe. We came over here as refugees. We had no money. Nothing. Most had no education. If it was young generation. And they came to this country, and when they came to this country in the 50s, was anti-Semitic. If you wanted to go to top-notch school, it was very difficult. Harvard, Yale, was almost impossible to get in. Financially, it was impossible. And you had no, no money to even get in. But the number one thing the Jews did after the Holocaust in the U.S., top education was the most important for every Jewish family to send the kids to the top school that can possible send the kids to. And they did. And those kids finished the top school where they couldn't get a job because it was anti-Semitic. People was against them. In the 50s, the U.S. was actually anti-Semitic. And they didn't want to employ Jews, which actually graduated Harvard, Yale, and the top school. Well, what you do as a Jewish person, you can get a job. Okay, you open your own. If you were trying to get a job at the bank, <coughs> bank don't remember the people came very poor. They had no money except education. And what they did, they went and get their own bank. They started their own bank because they couldn't get a job at the bank. They started a small private bank, like Lehman Brother. They started Lehman Brother became like not a good name in two thousand and eight, but they started all those financial boutique investment banking because they couldn't get a job at the bank. And later in life, they became huge companies, as you know today. They went to law school. They got a job. They tried to get a job at the big law firm. They started all of them. But this story then, 20, 30 years later, became one of the biggest investment banker in the U.S., bigger law firm in the U.S. Now, we understand education was the number two. Now, why they became so successful? Not because they're very smart. Became very successful because they couldn't get their own bank and they could not get big company to do business with them. They focused on something unique they could not get. They needed a client. But how to get the client? 
the focus with small, medium-sized companies. When those medium-sized companies grew, the law firm grew, the investment banker grew. And what's the point of the message was talking to about those Arab Israeli men? You guys in Israel still facing racism. The Jews don't like you. What's unique to you? First thing, get your kids to the best education you can. Second, do what the Jews cannot do. An example, you speak Arabic. Israel is a startup nation, excellent technology. Fly to Pakistan, sell technology in Pakistan. Because if you're Muslim, you're most likely to be able to get to Dubai or some the neighboring country, which me as a Jewish person could not go and sell an Israeli product in the place the Jews not allowed. But if you're Muslim, take advantage of what you do have. By having the advantage, you speak Arabic, you're Muslim, and you're living in a country which has a great technology, get those technology and get the right to sell it in the places the Jews cannot do. Do, so, do something better in the Jewish people. If something they cannot do, and leverage it. And maybe 20, 30 years later, you never know where you're going to be. And that was the message, and the same message to the Arab Israeli or to the Palestinian. Don't cry, my life, it sucks. Trust me, I grew up in orphanage. I grew up in a foster family. I went to America. I went to business. I changed my life. You, you're not going to be able to change your life unless you change your life. Don't go and complain. My leadership, my powerful government, my enemies, you know, who cares? Go and do it yourself. If you do it yourself, you'll be surprised where life will take you. And that's my, my comment was to the Arab Israeli mayor. Exercise your right to vote. Do something different, educate your kids, your youth. 25 years later, you leverage. Israel in 68 years today became the, 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 the one of the countries in the Middle East which dis- developed so much technology sold worldwide. Israel in the 50s was in a recession. They had no money. Today is one of the wealthy. They have no oil. They have no natural resources. But Israel became a very wealthy country. Why? Because they did something the neighboring country could not do. And the the people living in Israel, Muslim, Jews, whatever they are, leverage what you do, have, and somebody else does that, and do it better. And then, then you, you never know when that's going to take you. And that's what my message will be to the Palestinian. Go and leverage the opportunity, what the Israeli could not do. Because you can go and, and you know, you cannot create an intel in Palestine or intel in the West Bank. You know what? Go and work with the intel, take the technology, sell it to the... A neighboring country, which Israeli could not do it, and, and and you never know when it's going to take you. And that would be my message. That's a beautiful message, and uh, you know my. I'm sorry. Unfortunately, you're not able to hear me, uh, but I was saying that my favorite teacher's message is that. Um, uh, but, but anyway, your question, I'm sorry, I'm reading the, yeah, I'm reading the last, how you can connect, if you're Muslim, how you can connect, well, Facebook, the way you're doing it, it's a genius, I mean, it's clearly Facebook, I mean, Facebook, Twitter, the world is flat, as Thomas Friedman wrote in his book, there's no more border, or passport, or, you know, we're talking to each other, you're in Pakistan, I'm Israeli, we're supposed to be enemy, we're not, I went to Syria helping my own enemy, I went and crossed an enemy line when I was a soldier. In the, I was trying to be, you know, I was an officer. And when I actually was a soldier, I was trained. Those were my enemy. I was trained to take over their mountain, their building, their houses. You know what? As a soldier, I was trying to do it. There's no more border and mountain. You know, it's through Facebook. You go and connect with the people. You know, I crossed border and climb under a fence in Turkey to enter an enemy to help my own enemies. And how I did it? Because I talked to them on Facebook and Twitter and I got to know them. And then we met in neighboring country outside of Syria. Then I got to trust them. Then I put their life, my life, in their hand. When I was going into, remember, I went and crossed an enemy line, crawled under a fence to help my own enemy because it was no longer my enemy. It was a virtual fence. The fence don't mean anything. You know, it's people. And and that's the same thing. The Facebook, the way you're doing it, of connecting those people together, if it's Jews and Muslim, Palestinian, Israeli, who cares? We're all the same anyway. 
Um, thank you so much. I know you have to go. Uh, hey, thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate everything you do. You're a wonderful organization, by the way. Thank you so much. Thank you, Moti. I look forward to talking to you again. I'm sorry? We will talk another time. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye. It's one o'clock.